I love this series called The I Am, because really, we're hearing from Jesus' closest earthly friend, his disciple John, and he's creating these powerful visual images because he wants us to know how amazing Jesus is. So this isn't just about, okay, Jesus is the bread of life and he's the living water and I'll memorize a list of these visual images. It's really about, John wants us to say, wow, Jesus is more amazing than I thought. He's more mysterious than I thought. He, he, this is wonderful that, that we would fall in love with Jesus more. And so we've looked at a number of different specific uh, pictures of Jesus. And as John the fisherman, who ends up, at, he's quite an artist with words, and now he is saying, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he uses this incredibly important picture. In fact, it's interesting. Um, part of what we do in a message is we just focus on a passage of Scripture so that it, it kind of penetrates. And as I've been preparing for and reading uh, John and reading about light, it's amazing to me that Jesus and light show up all the way through the Bible. I mean, Genesis starts with, and he said, let there be light. And that's the beginning of creation. And then at the end, Revelation, it says, in the new Jerusalem, there won't be a sun or a moon because Jesus, the sun, will be the light. And then I look in the book of John, and it's in chapter 1, in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in chapter 11, in chapter 12. All the way through, he uses this picture that if you walk with Jesus as your light, then you're not going to stumble and you're not going to die in darkness and you're going to live in light. And so it's this beautiful, powerful picture that Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And you know, bread of life, bread's important, water is important, but light is everything. In fact, John 1 says, that when Jesus was born, in him was life, and that life was the light of the world. And you think, not just kind of having daylight so you can not stumble, but if we didn't have light, there would be no life on planet Earth. <laughs> like, unless the sun were bathing our planet, we're not, you know, it was, was pouring energy into our planet, we'd be dead. So I want you to visualize with me for just a moment what darkness is like. So let's shut off all the lights. So it's all dark, and I, I was telling you a story, I want to tell you a story about going into a theater, and I don't remember what it was, I think it was like one of the Star Wars sequels or something, but you know, you're living for a couple of hours in this fantasy world, but your eyes adjust to the dark. When you first walk in, it like, seems really dark, and then after a while, it seems pretty light, and your, your eyes open to take in just a little bit of light, and then we were done with all the, you know, uh, fighting and all the dramatic action of this fantasy world, really, where they're, they're using out-of-this-world stuff. And so we were going to head out, and it was like the middle of the day. And instead of going all the way out through the lobby, we decided to just hit the back doors and go straight out. Well, that means we walked from the darkness of the theater straight into the full sunlight. And I'm telling you, it was like blinding. It was like, yeah, it's good, so you can see not to stumble, but it was like way too much. We just react to it. But then I thought, you know what also you were starting to go? You were going from fantasy to reality. <laughs> you were thinking, okay, where did I put my car? And, uh, oh, yeah, I've got bills to pay. And, uh, oh, yeah, all those problems that I kind of forgot about, they're still there. And, oh, yeah, what about lunch? And so I think, you know, Jesus said the light clarifies. It, it's sometimes hard to take. Sometimes we run from the light because the light exposes us. The light is a little hard to take. And yet Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And, and C.S. Lewis has this great quote. He says, I love Christ not only for the fact that, in the same way that I love the sun, it's not only for I see it, but by it I can see everything else. Isn't that a great thought? Not only do I see Jesus because he's the light of the world, but because he's the light of the world, he changes the way I see everything. And as I adjust my eyes to living in the light instead of living in the darkness then it changes me. That's what Jesus meant. In that picture of light, there's a powerful story in John chapter 9. And it's about Jesus healing a blind man, a man who's never seen light, a man who was blind, it says, from birth. And now he is an adult. So he's lived years. And, and you think about what this must have been like for him to, 
to live in a society where there really weren't any allowances made for people who had some kind of a handicap, and he was totally blind. And so in John chapter 9, it starts with this scripture. It says, And as he went along, he saw a blind man. Jesus saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, (laughs) with probably very little compassion, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? (laughs) So there's this kind of callous question, like, you know, we see this poor guy and he's having a terrible life, but we want to ask you this theological question. Was it because he sinned, how he would sin in his mother's womb? I'm not sure what they thought, but, or was it his parents that sinned? And they were probably opting for the parents. And Jesus gives this answer, which I think probably, <laughs> we, we think we've got these, all these theological questions figured out. And, and what Jesus said is, neither, <laughs> wrong, both counts. This man nor his parents sinned, not that they had never sinned, but that's not the reason for the blindness. And then he blows their mind and he says, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's a heavy thought. This man has endured years of blindness and difficulty. Why? Because God had a plan to do something incredible. But in his majority, in his adulthood, Jesus would come in and heal him. And then there's a fascinating story, and if you read the devotions, it's, it's going to be in, Je- in Tuesday where you walk through the, the chapter 9 to read it. But let me just kind of remind you and tell you the story. Jesus finds this man, and he heals him, and he does it by spitting in the dirt and making mud and putting it on his eyes. And so the guy with, <laughs> who's now blind and dirty, he goes down and he washes his eyes clear And I don't know if you can imagine what this would have been like, but somebody who's never seen his family, never seen anything, he washes his his eyes and miraculously he opens them up and he can see. And as you can imagine, he's bouncing around and excited and joyful. But the Pharisees figure out that his eyes, that he was healed on the Sabbath. And so they're really uptight about that. And so they said, it couldn't have been a man of God because he wouldn't have done it on the Sabbath. And so out of that logic, then they start attacking this man and his family. And this guy, he's a little bit lippy. They're kind of saying, so what happened? And we want to know what it's about. And he's like, I don't know. I was blind and now I see. And, and then they start making pressure on his parents. Like, was he really born blind? And, and they start really trying to discredit Jesus any way they can. And so then they finally circle back around and they say to this man, give glory to God and tell us, is this man a prophet? Do you think he's a prophet? Or, you know, and, and this guy's just, just he, can't, he can't deal with the Pharisees kind of nitpicking. And he's just, he's just excited that he can see. And finally, they come to him and they just ask him again. And he says, why? I already told you. Do you want to be his disciples too? <laughs> And that really ticks him off. It's like, we're disciples of Abraham and da 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 or disciples of Moses, I guess they said. And so they get really uh, ticked, and they basically kick him out. And then there's this tender moment. You know, they're saying, who healed you? And he's like, I never saw him. I was blind, remember? And then finally, Jesus circles back around in a quiet moment, and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he said, show me who it is. I... I don't know who that is. And Jesus said, that's me, who you are seeing right now. And in a powerful moment, the man says, I believe. And then he goes and tells everybody, of course, that Jesus is the one that healed him, and and it creates this whole new new cycle of drama. But at the beginning of the story where Jesus said, this man was blind because the works of God are going to be revealed, he goes on in the next two verses And he says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So I had never really seen this phrase before. But he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Very specific. He he is the light of the world, clearly. But Jesus in his humanness could only be one place at one time. And so he was saying, for right now, I am the light of the world. 
So what does that mean to us? What does it mean that he's the light of the world? Well, when you try to describe what is the, the significance behind this image of light, I think it's multiple, and you start trying to nail it down, and I think really it's like the nature of light. That light comes in, and it looks like it's just white. It's this bright, illuminating beam. And then you break it up through a prism, and all of a sudden it's broken into these incredibly beautiful parts. And so light reveals the glory of God, but it also talks about truth, which is what I think the focus of this story is. It's the light of love. It's the light of peace. It's the light of hope. It's the light of all of these things that, that become ours as a part of, a, of followers of Jesus. And so what is light? What does it really stand for? It stands for Jesus and everything that he brings, the grace and the mercy and the peace and the gentleness he brings. And so I think that's like light goes in and it breaks into all these beautiful pieces and out of that we can see Jesus more clearly. For this weekend, however, we're going to talk about specifically how I think in this passage, really the emphasis is the light brings the holiness of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, the reality of Jesus into darkness. And I I don't know if you've thought about this, but darkness isn't really a thing. I mean, darkness is just the absence of light. When when there's a dark situation, you can pick up a, a flashlight and you can put light into the darkness. You don't ever find a flash dark. You can't insert darkness into something. You can't have a dark bulb. You can't have a, 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 like a jar of darkness. Darkness is just what happens when there is no light. And so this picture where Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it's actually the light of truth. And in this passage, it's in contrast to all the darkness around. And so there's a couple of kinds of darkness here. You see in this passage, religious darkness. You see, the disciples, first of all, thought, okay, if there's a blind man, somebody sinned. Because in their thinking, in their darkness of religion, sin equals punishment. And so if somebody is struggling with some kind of a negative thing, it must be punishment for sin. And then the Pharisees had this incredible religious system where they were thinking they were trying to please God. But the miracle that Jesus did was couldn't be of God because it was on the Sabbath. You see, they had this religious system that caused them eventually to try to kill the Son of God. And in many of the same ways, there's all kinds of religions which are trying to somehow make a code of conduct so that we can please God. And even people who say they aren't religious are religious because they're answering questions like, is there a God? What happens after we die? Why are we here? What is sin? Is there any way for sin to be healed or taken care of? You see, no matter how sincere you are, no matter how ornate of a system you have, no matter what your picture is, if it doesn't have the accurate picture of Jesus, it's darkness. And in fact, the Pharisees, when Jesus says, something about blindness. They're saying, do you think we're blind at the end of chapter 9? They said, are you calling us blind? And he makes this powerful statement. He says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now you claim that you can see, and so your guilt remains. The religious darkness that somehow discounts Jesus. You see, all religious systems say Jesus is a good guy, but they don't say he's the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the only hope that we have, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so, if they diminish Jesus, then they are religions of darkness. And so you see that in the many religious systems that are around us. And then also, you see that in the light versus cultural darkness. Not only was the the religion of the Jewish people, but there were Greek gods and Roman gods, and particularly Greek philosophy, uh, Gnosticism and other things that that were flavoring people's view of the world. And Jesus said, I am not of this world. And he said, because I'm not of this world, they have hated me. And because you're not of this world, if you follow me, they may hate you too. 
So the, the essence of the idea I want you to get across here is following Jesus is always going to be countercultural. It was counter to the Greek philosophy of the day. It was counter to all the voices today that are saying, this is the truth. This is the way. This is the lifestyle. And you know, we, we live in a deeply me-centered culture right now where it's like, I have the right to choose what I do with my body. I have the right to choose my gender. I have the right to choose my sexual orientation. I have the right to choose what's right and wrong. I have the right to define sin. And against all of those, Jesus would say, that's darkness. Come to the light of Jesus. And so the, the philosophies of the world, and I remember when I was in a faith crisis in high school, I, I remember thinking about Eastern religions and thinking about evolution and thinking about all these voices saying, this is the truth, believe this. And boy, these last couple of years have been a great example of all kinds of people saying, this is the truth. And Jesus' light cuts through all of that. And he says, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the only light of the world. And I want you to pause for a moment. And I want you to ask yourself that question. Have I chosen to walk in the light? And the first clear statement that comes out of all of John is that stepping into the light means believing that Jesus is the only solution that we have that he is the one who's telling us the truth, that he's the one who gave his life, that he is the, the picture of love and truth that allows us to have a relationship with God where we last forever and ever with him. When the Pharisees were putting Jesus down, he looked at them and he said, then you're going to die in your sins. Basically, he was saying, you're living in darkness, and if you die in darkness, you're going to be in darkness forever. I don't know if you've thought about this, but let me, let me give you a powerful phrase I heard out of a message. That for unbelievers, this life on earth is as close to heaven as they're ever going to get. And for believers, this life here on earth is as close to hell as they're ever going to get. Why? Because God's goodness, God's light is shining on our world whether people hate Him or love Him. The rain comes on the good and the evil. The sun shines on the good and the evil. But after we die, then our choice of either living in the light or living in darkness becomes permanent. And so if you have fairly new to this church thing, if you're just kicking the tires and you're learning about Jesus, maybe you've been in church a long time and, and you've been caught in the culture of religion but not really a relationship with Jesus, I want to ask you to think about what does it mean for you to believe, to put your life completely into trusting in Jesus? And I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of the service to actually pray and make that decision. But I want you to think about it and I want you to, to listen. And if the Holy Spirit is tapping on your heart and saying, no matter how good you think you are, how religious you think you are, you are not walking in the light, that you would listen to that voice and you'd surrender to Jesus. So Jesus not only says, I am the light of the world, and while he was walking around here on earth, he was the light in the world, but now he says, we are the light of the world. And I think this is a fascinating understanding as we look at this fluorescent ball. So it has no luminous qualities of its own, but when you take the light and you shine it right on it, what happens is it absorbs the light. And as it absorbs the light, then you take the light away and it is able to show the light. And so the longer you put the light on it, the more light that it's exposed to, the more you're able to see the light after it's gone. And what a wonderful picture that Jesus is the light of the world, but when he shines in our life, he illumines us, but he also makes us an illumination. And that means that we need to continually go back to the light of the gospel, what's true about Jesus, to, to the light of the scriptures. How does it create a new reality instead of the cultural reality we live in? How are we seeing the light of the Holy Spirit within us as he speaks to us and challenges us to, to do things like last week we talked about Jeremy and receiving those gifts by somebody that the Holy Spirit prompted. And every time we spend time with the light, we become light. 
And so it's a powerful image that also reminds us that we don't have light in ourselves. We have light because of Jesus. So we need to continually go back and get refilled with the light. The second part of this story <clears throat> is that because he is the light of the world while he was in the world, then now he says to us, we are the light of the world. Huge switch. But the, the picture is that Jesus has brought the light to us, and now we've become recipients of that light. So there's a powerful passage in Ephesians, <clears throat> which it says exactly that. For you were once darkness without Jesus, but now you are light in the Lord. Live, then, as children of the light. And then he says, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and that's what I'm talking about, that, that rainbow spread where he says righteousness and truth, that all of those are evidence of the light. And find out what pleases the Lord. And then he goes on and he says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. And I know sometimes there's a temptation. I want to know what those vulgar terms mean. I want to know what that that filthy movie's about. I, I don't want to seem stupid. And Jesus said, actually, be innocent about what's evil. It's okay. Don't dabble in darkness. And then he goes on and he says, everything exposed by the light becomes visible, which absolutely makes sense. And if you're walking through your house in the middle of the night and you can't see that <laughs> table or chair leg and bang your foot on it, it's because it's dark. So if things are in the light, then they are visible. But look at this next phrase, because this phrase really stuck out to me. It says, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. I'd never really noticed that before. All my years of reading through this, it was like, oh, what he's saying is exactly like that fluorescent ball. That when the light shines on something, on us, when we have come to believe and receive Jesus, then we become light. And so we are the light of the world because we've received light. In fact, Jesus uses a very powerful image in, in Matthew chapter 5, and he, he actually is telling his disciples that they have received this light, and because of that, they are to go out and to spread it. So it's because we have received light, and it's also because we are sent ones. Now, that's really the word apostle, and there are 12 disciples became, or the 11 disciples became the capital A apostles. They were sent out to tell the light message to the world. But all of us are small A apostles. We are, each one of us, sent out. And we are sent to our homes, to our neighborhoods, to our schools, to our workplaces. And we are to be light in those places. Now, I, I have to say something just personally here to you as well. It's been a wonderful opportunity for me to be pastor at Family Church for the last 36 years. And it has been an up and down, and sometimes I feel like I've done things well, and sometimes I look back and I see how foolish I was and, and mistakes I made and people I hurt. And so there's a, there's a lot of history to being here. And yet, for whatever God has done through me and however He's used me, I am so excited as I see Pastor Craig stepping in as the Sutherland Campus Pastor, and, and Jason is now going to be the leader of the teaching team and lead that team, and I see Drew heading up the Green Campus, and Jeremy and Crystal and other leaders stepping up. I just want to tell you, they're doing a great job, and I can't be more excited to hand off and to say, here's the responsibility and the burden now, and see that God is going to take that light, just as He always does that there's an unbroken chain of light from Jesus being here on earth all the way down, and now I'm taking some of my responsibilities and handing them on, and God is going to do amazing things. And I hope you stay here faithfully to be a part of that and to watch it and to, to support those leaders as you have supported me. I also want to challenge you at this last point that you let your light shine. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. And then he goes on to say, A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bushel. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
So I want to give you just a couple of very practical applications here. I want you to see first that he says he gives light to everyone in the house. Shining your light starts at home. And there's two parts to shining the light. He says you have to, they're going to see your good deeds and they're going to glorify your Father. So for me, that means you have to do good deeds. <laughs> it's not just good thoughts or good intentions or good conduct. It's good deeds, serving, caring, loving, talking, listening. And then he says you have to give glory to God. You have to acknowledge that it comes because of Jesus in your life. But how does that happen? Well, for those of you who are, who are raising children right now, your kids are going to see your good deeds and they're also going to see your bad deeds. And let me challenge you. We need to be honest as parents. We need to be transparent. And when we blow it, we need to not fake it. We need to say, man, daddy sure shouldn't have gotten angry at that. Because they're watching us when we're on duty and when we're off duty. They watch us when we're embarrassed because the policeman pulls us over. They watch us when we say some words that we should never have said. They watch us when we get angry. They watch us when we argue. And I want to tell you this. What your kids need to see is not perfection, but progress. They need to see that you're growing. They need to see that you're learning. They need to see that God convicts you, that He's changing you in the process. And that'll be a light in your home. We need to be a light in our friendship and neighborhood circles. And sometimes good deeds means you mow their lawn for them when you know that they've had surgery, or you, you water their plants when they're on vacation, or maybe you take something over because you've got something to share and you share it with them. Maybe it means that, that you ask questions like, how are you really doing? Or, or something simple as getting the mail for them. Just show them your care and your love and your concern and, and listen to their concerns and their needs. Pick up on those. When you're at school, maybe it means helping somebody with homework or helping them do a lab or maybe invite somebody who seems like they're left out into your circle at lunchtime or, or into your after-school party or whatever. It means seeing people and drawing them toward you by being kind and loving and caring and showing your light. What about your work? Sometimes that's really tough. But I, I think for that, those people I watch really shining at their, at their job, part of it means that they just take that extra effort to care about people. That when you work together with people, you find out when they're up and when they're down and when they're struggling and and if you ask them, how is that going with your son? How are things happening with your health? What's going on with your parents? And, and you remember the conversations where they were a little bit vulnerable. And instead of just talking about sports and the weather, you step across that line to private and you, you've earned that privilege of speaking into their life. And you pray for them. And when it's appropriate, you tell them you're praying for them. And I, and I think how easy at work it is to be somebody who's critical and backstabbing and gossiping. and Man, if you are none of that, or if when you do that, you confess it, and instead you're the one that brings encouragement, you're the one that defends somebody, you're the one that really is genuinely bringing light to a dark place, then people will see your good works, and then at some point you acknowledge <laughs> that it's not from you, it's from Jesus. And because of that, you give glory to God and you point to Him. And so, very simple message today, very powerful and important, is that Jesus is the light of the world. And because of that, those of us who are followers of Jesus, we are now privileged to be light. He says that now we are light. That's our identity. And then we just can't put a bushel on it. We just can't cover it up. We just can't hide. We need to let the light shine. And Douglas County is going to be changed because people from Family Church are letting their light shine in their own homes. They're letting their light shine where they work. They're letting their light shine at school. They're letting their light shine in every neighborhood where we have followers of Jesus. And because of that, the light of Jesus is going out into Douglas County. And you know what? Some people will not like it. Jesus said, you don't like the light <laughs> because your deeds are evil and it exposes evil. But some will be drawn to the light and they will be attracted to you and the, 
the Jesus they see in you, and ultimately they'll be attracted to Jesus for themselves. And that is our desire and our hope, that we be people helping people find and follow Jesus because we are doing our good works and we are acknowledging that it comes from God. And because of that, we are shining our light to the world. I'm going to release to the campus pastors and give you a chance to talk through the blessed strategy and how that totally fits with what we're talking about. And uh, God bless you and thanks for joining us. So you're watching us online. And let me just kind of walk through how this light of the world picture really fits with our, our blessed strategy because it really begins to put actual, you know, feet on it, if you will. So the B says begin with prayer. And I hope that you are praying for three or four of your friends, neighbors, coworkers. And that's a great start. But I think you should also pray that God would open your eyes. That, that the disciples looked at that blind man and they said, what's his problem? Instead of looking with compassion and, and with an eye to heal. So ask God to open your eyes to see the people in your life that he is working in. Because God's already at work ahead of you. So ask that he would work and that you would see it. And then you look and listen. So the best kind of good deeds are the ones where you know that that's what they really want. Not because I thought you needed this. And sometimes it's like remembering birthdays and special days. Sometimes it's remembering that they've got some problems coming up or problems they're dealing with and asking about those and, and not being nosy, but, but showing real, genuine care and listening and asking good questions. And then you don't know the rest of it necessarily, but E stands for eat, which is always a good idea. And the first S is serve. So serving is doing good deeds. And if you could think of every day, every time that you try to do something for somebody, do it in a way that acknowledges that this came from God. Now, I don't know if you remember the message from last week, but Pastor Jeremy talked about on a long trip that he took, two different people out of the blue came up and said, God told me to bless you, and they gave him an envelope that had $200 in it. It's like, whoa. They were listening to the Holy Spirit. They had a, a gift already in their hand, and maybe you can't do $200, but what, what if you carried around a, an envelope with $20 in it? Or maybe you, you said, I want to give a half hour of my time this week to serve somebody. I'm going to find somebody to serve because that's what I'm about. You see, it's a different mindset that says, I am intentionally going to be light in my world, and then, God, you show me how and where. I'm ready to go. You just show me how. And sometimes it's easy to, to pick on somebody that's a homeless person that just needs a meal, and I don't mean pick on them. I mean choose that to do something nice for them. But let me tell you, there are hurting people all around you. And if you will ask, ask God, he will show you, and then he will show you how to be light in their world. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you that you are the light of the world and that you've given us light and not just white light, but beautiful colors to see the world as you see it. And Father, I ask that you would help us to be light in our world, to share with other people the good things that you've given to us and then to share with them how it's you that's been the giver. And I pray right now as we, as we pause in prayer that for those who've never come to accept you, who've never been in the light, that you, God, would give them a moment right now when they can stop and say, Jesus, I choose to believe you. I want my life to be filled with your light. I surrender and ask that you would forgive my sins, and I'd love to be part of your family. And if that's you in a quiet moment, wherever you're sitting, you can simply invite Jesus' light into your life. And then for those of us who are followers, I pray that you would make that specific commitment. I'm going to be a, a light this week. And maybe the Spirit of God's already given you ideas. Maybe not, but look for those opportunities to be light in your world and let God shine through you. And if you ask Him for that, He will give you that opportunity. So God, open up our eyes, help us to step into those opportunities and to be light to someone right today, right this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us.